taking it like I did. everybody who's joining us on our live stream. I'm thankful for you being here with us. Even if I can't see your faces, I'm grateful for your presence with us during this worship service. We begin with our confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. And of one another. Gracious God, have, have mercy, mercy on us. We, we confess, confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We, we are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things you have done and things you have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ. through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 735. If you're following along in a hymnal, we will also have the words on the screen here.
We continue um, with the greeting and then the curious. Save me in your steadfast love. 
A reading from 1 Peter, in the second chapter. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. Like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, See, I laid in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you, then, who believe, uh, he is precious, but for the... and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. We'll speak the gospel acclamation. Alleluia. I am the way, the truth. Alleluia. The gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still don't know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. In fact, will do greater works than these, because I'm going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Grace be to you and peace from the one who was and is and is to come. Amen. Today we have a lesson from a little biblical letter that many of us um, probably don't even know about. Having problems with some mic here. That's okay. Um, First Peter was probably not written as it's purported to be in the Bible where it says, Um, that it was written by Peter. It was probably not written by the disciple Peter himself. Um, It was common in biblical days to use the name of a well-known teacher or a well-known figure so that you could sort of um, add legitimacy to your writing. Um, And even if it is written under a pseudonym, even if it is written under somebody else's name, it is still part of our biblical teaching. 
Um, some of the phrases from here may be familiar. Probably you've read something, yeah. um, possibly even this passage that we had from 1 Peter 2. You may have heard that before, chosen priests, a chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, that kind of um, phrasing. But it's not a, a book of the Bible that a lot of people either memorize or um, I don't think I've ever met anybody who said, oh, my favorite Bible verse is 1 Peter something. It's not one of those books that's sort of highly known. Um, as I've described before, the Christian church began as a movement within the Jewish faith. Jesus was a Jew. His direct mission was to Jewish people. And in later days and even after his death, there was then the movement of sharing with Gentiles um, and the, the growth of the Gentile Christian movement. Gentile believers then eventually were allowed, were invited to be followers of um, non-believers, basically. And even in Jesus' lifetime, his message often was spread through speaking in synagogues. So by the time 1 Peter was written, the church wasn't just this little splinter group. Um, it had been sort of a, a small movement, and then eventually got larger and larger as the word spread further and further. 1 Peter is written as a letter to churches in Asia Minor. It's sort of outside Jesus' Jesus. immediate area that he um, was teaching in. And so that's one of the first places that the, the word of, the, of Jesus spread to. The author of 1 Peter then spoke his message to a scattered group of believers that were facing a challenge. They were separated. There were times at that because of your faith. And in some parts of that um, time period and some places, it was worse uh, persecution than the others. But at the very least, you'd be sort of um, sort of shunned or set off to the side if you were a believer in Christ. Um, and they were really facing a challenge of faith during that time. Jesus was physically not with them. Now, he had been resurrected. The story had started to spread, but he, uh, he was not physically with them. And even in those very early church days, if you've ever read anything from St. Paul, there's a belief that Jesus' second coming was going to happen very, very quickly. So there was a feeling that after Jesus died and he was resurrected, that in within just um, a single lifetime or two, that Jesus might be coming back. And so as they stayed around longer and longer, Jesus wasn't coming back, and Jesus wasn't coming back, and the things they had held their hopes on and had pinned their hopes on were not happening. Um, they began to um, sort of falter in their faith a bit. And so into that message, the writer of First Peter describe the people of God in at least these three different ways. Um, there's multiple ways, but at least three distinct ways. Living stones, a spiritual house, and priests serving God. First, the people are living stones. The people of God are living stones. Many of us appreciate the awe-inspiring view of St. John the Divine Cathedral in New York City or St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican or the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. These are all physical buildings that have stones that are built up in ways that they honor God. They're very awe-inspiring. If you've ever stood in one of them, it's just an amazing view. But we Christians here are described as living stones. Living stones. Each of us is an active and alive part of the church. We function as living stones of God, even when we are apart from the building. Um, in seminary, one of my professors told the story of uh, being a young pastor when a friend came to visit, and the friend said to him, could we go visit the church now? And he said, of course not. We couldn't possibly get to all of them 
in this afternoon that you're visiting uh, because that idea is the stones of God are not cemented or tuck pointed or installed. The stones of God are not the building that's here. The living stones of God are <clears throat> the living stones of God are sent out, they're scattered, they're alive. Second, the people of God are a spiritual house. The people of a particular worshiping community or religious gathering may see themselves communally at times as a spiritual house. And I think we see that most in places where a congregation goes through a time of difficulty with their church building. For example, last year, Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Oak Park had a fire in their church building. They ended up having to take all of their ministries and programs off-site for a period of at least six months. Now, I think they're probably almost ready to move back into their building, and they can't really do a, a new launch there yet. Um, they've been using space in a Baptist church um, in their neighborhood. Another example of this whole um, idea of being a spiritual home maybe connected to a physical home, maybe not so much connected to a physical home, is Resurrection Lutheran in Franklin Park, which is where my husband serves as pastor. And RLC, several years back, sold their large church building. Um, many people mistakenly thought that the church had closed, and in fact, since then, as they've had anniversary celebrations, people have said, oh, I thought that church closed. They just didn't understand that selling the building didn't necessarily mean that the congregation was disbanding. Um, during that time that they've been out of that big building, uh, they've had a renewed sense of sort of what are they all about, and a renewed um, amount of energy to focusing on what their ministry actually is and making that ministry happen. Last year, they purchased a small storefront, which is like the right size for their congregation and seems to be a great place for them to sort of fill in the ministry that they have and then be open for new things as well. The, the people, people of God communally, communally serve as a spiritual house, which doesn't necessarily have a physical residence or a mailing address. The people of God are the spiritual home of God. Third, the people of God are priests serving God. Now this harkens back to Luther's priesthood of all believers. In Luther's worldview, of course, there's ordained pastors. They have their role. Um, priests have their role in leadership. But they are um, not the only leaders in the church. All of the baptized people of God are calling, call, have a calling to be priests. When someone is baptized, even in the Lutheran church today, maybe not today, but <laughs> in these days, uh, when someone is baptized, we give their families a little candle or we give it to them if they're older. And we say, let your light so shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. It's our way of acknowledging that every single person that is baptized in our church, this congregation or any other, is called to be a priest to serve in the world every day. So now I ask the question uh, that I ask myself a lot, what are you able to accomplish these days as a priest serving God? How is your priestly vocation going this week? Or try these questions. Maybe these are a little easier. Have you brought hope into a hopeless place? Or have you brought hope to someone that was struggling with despair? Have you listened to someone who was challenged in their faith these days? Or maybe they had a lot of bad things happening and they saw bad things happening to good people and they were struggling with what does that mean and how can we trusting God during these days? Have you been a vessel through which others have encountered God? Have you reminded people of the truths of God that are hard to hold on to in socially distant, pandemic-filled, panic-inducing world that we live in? 
Have you provided spiritual or emotional care to someone who is facing difficult days? You said yes to any of those. There's probably a lot of other examples. Uh, you have been a priest serving God in your daily life. Psalm 31 that we shared earlier also um, pairs well with this uh, image of us as living stones. In Psalm 31, the psalmist says that God is a strong rock. God is a castle to keep me safe. God is my crag and my stronghold. God is my tower and strength. In those days when I feel like my foundation is weak, like I don't know whether I can be strong uh, when I feel more like a hard-headed rock than a living stone, um, I can turn to God my rock, my fortress, my stronghold, my tower, my strength. I am never alone. I am never abandoned. Even when my foundation feels crumbly, I can trust that God is here with me, that God is a strong rock that I can lean on in all those times of trouble. Even when we as living stones falter, God, who is our strong rock, remains faithful. As the psalmist writes, Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. For you are my crag and my stronghold. For the sake of your name, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that they have secretly set for me. For you are my tower of strength. Amen. Our hymn for today, our hymn of the day, is Come My Way, My Truth, My Life. And it is found in the ELW number 816, or if you're following along the worship plan, or we'll also have it on the screen, and I hope you can see those well. <laughs>
was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Build us up, Mother and God, as living stones united in your spiritual house. Continually strengthen your church as it is sent forth to proclaim your love. We pray especially for new Humble us, Creator God, as part of your creation. Fill us with respect and awe for the world you've made, including volcanoes, ocean currents, tropical rainstorms, glaciers, and other forces that both destroy and create. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Align your ways to align our ways to your love, O oh God. We pray for countries, leaders, and other organizations as they prepare places for those seeking refuge and safety. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. God of healing and rest, help those who, whose hearts are heavy and weighed down by many troubles. Comfort their suffering, ease their distress, and carry their burdens. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Nurturing God, we pray for those who tend and teach young children, for the safe pregnancies of expectant parents, and for families who struggle with infertility and miscarriage. We give thanks for all who have shown mothering care, and we remember all for whom this day is difficult. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, this morning we lift up all those who are in need. We lift those who are grieving. We lift those who are struggling, those who are facing difficulty financially, those who are facing difficulty with mental health challenges. We pray for those who are... Um, work in essential businesses, and especially for those healthcare workers that every day have to go and um, busy themselves with the work of caring for all of us. We pray for all those people who are facing difficulty because of the length of the um, stay-at-home orders, and just we pray that you be with all of us. And now this morning, God, we pray for those who um, are being lifted in
With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us... Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Um, as far as announcements, I just announced that we'll continue to gather on Sunday mornings at 9.30, that in a few minutes I'll get on the Zoom call for coffee hour, <coughs> excuse me, for our virtual coffee hour, and I hope some of you will join us there. Um, we'd love to see your smiling faces. That's one of the things that I love about having the Zoom coffee hour after having this, where I just sort of speak into a camera, and the people are there somewhere. Um, <laughs> so it's a great opportunity for us to see faces and connect personally. Um, yeah, I think that's it.